And we thank you tonight for the countless blessings that we've had even this day. As we look back, we bless you. Some of us may be more deeply in sin and in the mire. But I remember the word of the psalmist. He says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. We thank you that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you put your, our record behind your back. We think of all that lays before us. But one day we shall see thee face to face. The face that overwhelmed John on the Isle of Patmos. The face, face that Isaiah saw in all his majesty and in all his glory and Daniel the same. We thank you that we've not followed cunningly devised fables. We bless you again for this word, this lamp to our feet and this light unto our path. If we walk in darkness, it's by choice. There's a deliberate stepping out of light which always reveals and exposes us to try and cover up in darkness where we can't be seen. But Lord, we know there's nothing hid from your eyes. We see through a glass darkly. You never see through a glass darkly. We know in part. And what a small part it is. But Lord, I bless you for the vastness of your person as we've sung already tonight. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Before the earth was formed, or as your word so beautifully says, before the trees of the field clapped their hands, before the morning stars sang together, you were there. And we know we have that awesome picture we should all gaze at more often. In the book of the Revelation, the heaven and the earth fled from that face. Earlier in the book, I think of the place where it says the wicked, the high and lofty, the kings of the earth, <coughs> or the poor. There was a moment when they realized their despair, their desperate situation, and they called on the rocks and hills to hide them from the face, the face now that's livid with anger, the face such as Moses said when, when he said, Wilt thou not turn from thy fierce wrath? Lord, I believe we've sinned enough in America today that if you, if you burned us like a sinner tonight, we wouldn't have an argument with you. You've looked over a million transgressions of the Ten Commandments. You see people deliberately violating your laws, planning sin tonight, buying it, selling it, eating it, drinking it. And it looks, Lord, as though you just lean back and do nothing about it. But you've warned us in your holy word <clears throat> that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. I believe, Lord, with all my heart, that day is going to be a replay of history from the first man, Adam, in the world to the last one that died before you dissolved the heavens and the earth. All the ancient empires are going to rise, all the kings and all the noblemen, and all who in any way are shaped or haven't shaped the course of this world. Every one of us must give an account in that day. <clears throat> As we sang earlier tonight about your righteousness. I remember the Wesley hymn that says, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Midst flaming walls, in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day, and who ought to my charge shall lay. Fully absolved from this I am, from prayer from fear and death and sin and shame. What a blessed thing it is, Lord, to have the gift by your mercy of a conscience that's been purged with the blood of Christ. For the blood of, God, blood and goats, of, of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified only to the purifying of the flesh. But how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. 
I don't remember that the scripture called you Lord Jesus a great lamb but surely you're the greatest lamb that ever was even the so called perfect lamb in the Old Testament had its imperfections but we thank you you were so perfect you satisfied the heart of God yeah. I wonder Lord if in that moment when you said it is finished and you ended the Old Testament economy I wonder if it was at that time that all the, all the beings in heaven whoever they are sang the hallelujah chorus sang blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sit upon the throne I think of the kings of this earth the queen of England wears a, a crown worth of maybe seven or eight million dollars Charlemagne, I believe, had a crown made out of a gun that he captured from his enemies. Other men have had crowns, and yet the most memorable crown ever was made by men in scorn. It was a crown of thorns. I wonder what those men will feel like when they see you, Lord, in all your majesty, in all your glory. Maybe too, fall at your feet as dead. Lord Jesus, you are our only hope in this hopeless world. You're our only light in this dark world. You're our only peace in a world that's bent on war, spending billions to kill others. But we thank you that even now, you are our light and our life and our salvation. As the psalmist says, the Lord is my light, whom then shall I be afraid? <coughs> We sang tonight about being fearless because of your majesty, your power, your promises to be with us. We pray for missionaries tonight. We bless you for those who recklessly threw away their careers. They were destined maybe to be great research scientists in medicine, but they threw it away because of something you commanded them to do. I think again about Afghanistan was mentioned today trying to bring conscience to this Gorbachev or whoever he is he shrugged it off the misery the torture the agony and whatsoever men sow they reap hell will be a worse hell for them because of, they made people live through hell we think of those confined in Russia that we don't know much about maybe tragically don't think or pray too much for them Lord, I wish you'd provoke us to anger and give, us, give them a revival in Russia to make us see how stupid we are. Trying to work it up in a TV show. Lord, I maybe speak for others here tonight. <coughs> I'm so weary of seeing people try to do things in the energy of the flesh which can only be done in the spirit. remember that you came down Lord Jesus not in a flaming chariot as Elijah went up but stealing through the back door as it were through a woman's womb and then you didn't come down in the temple you came down in an upper room <coughs> with some very ordinary people who became most extraordinary you're still in that business Lord teach us how to pray through with a buoyant faith to lay hold of your precious promises <coughs> I think of Esau when he had been cheated he begged at his father's feet I guess he screamed it out asked thou but one blessing bless me even me O my father well Lord we might ask have you only ever one Finney only one Wesley out of the billions of earth Lord respectfully in the light of the judgment seat I believe you can do better than that I believe you'll raise up greater men men are not itching for a place in the sun men are not trying to build something with their name on it men were a hundred percent pure to see the glory of God men and women who are sick of playing church men and women who want to be good but don't want to be holy 
They want to sing, I am thine, O Lord, but all the time they keep a tight grip on themselves, on their hearts, on their affections, on their wills, on their time. Lord, I believe we're very near the end of time. And yet Joel says that you pour out your spirit on all flesh. Be merciful, do that a little here tonight, as much as we can bear. Wesley said in one hymn, I think, show me, Lord, as I can bear the depth of inbred sin. Show us what pollution hinders your perfect way in our lives. Show us how to move and when to move and where to move. We pray again for this fellowship here. You'll give wisdom to the leaders and for Gates of Life the same and for YWAM as their special night comes up a couple of nights next week. And ask your blessing for Community Christian Church and for Brother Joe Foss. Thank you for that precious man and that work. Now, Lord, we ask you <coughs> you in the language of your own word as we come to your book tonight that you'll open our eyes as we open the books that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law in Jesus name thank you ok let's look at the book and look at the book The book of Judges and chapter 18. I think I mentioned this before, but let me say it again because some of you weren't here anyhow. When the early Methodists started moving, and they moved in America, remember, they had circuit riders. Well, the circuit comes from the word circle, circus. But they weren't comedians by any way. John Wesley rode, rode uh, 245,000 miles on horseback, not on the same horse. There's only one record greater than that, that was by the great American Bishop Asbury. And he rode about 40,000 miles more than Wesley. So they had the circuit rider who went round here, there and everywhere. He would come the first Sunday here and the second Sunday there and they knew when he was coming. Then they had pastors who stayed to build up the people. And then they had some people that were called exhorters. One lady told me, you're not an exhorter, you're an exhorter. Oh. Very good. <clears throat> now this isn't a sermon tonight, it's not a Bible reading. It's an exhortation. I guess you'd say this book of Judges is exciting or thrilling or inspiring. It has majestic stories like the life of Samson. It has, a, the, of course, the great story of Gideon. And then a little over here you have Barak and Jephaniah. Quite a number of people mentioned in Hebrews 11 are mentioned here in the wonderful book of Judges. <clears throat> 18 Judges 18 verse 24 <clears throat> and he said you've taken away my gods which I made and the priest and you've gone away and what have I more and what is this that ye say unto me what aileth thee if you go back to verse 18 it says these went in. There were five men that had been sent out to spy. They went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, the molten image. Then said the priest, what do ye hear? The story actually begins in the previous chapter, in the 17th chapter. In verse 1 it says, there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now he's not Micah the prophet by a long way. His mother, you know how mysterious women are with money, 
and she managed to collect 1,100 1, shekels of silver. That was a vast fortune. And she hid it, and her son found it. And while she's praying, while she's calling on God to curse the man, he bursts in at the door, verse 2, and he said unto his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, and which thou hast cursed, and you spake up also in mine ears, Behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Bless thee, my son, not for stealing it, but for acknowledging he had stolen it. And go down the chapters, when he go home, I won't tell you at all. Verse 4, He restored the money to his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, and he made thereof a graven image and a molten image. So you see what she did. She took her wealth and put it into a molten image, not a golden calf, a silver calf. So a wealth became two things, a wealth and a worship. <clears throat> now in the chapter that we read, these men had been sent out to spy. I'm not going to mention them all the time, because of time, of course. <coughs> It says that they sent five men, if you read the 18th chapter. You come down to verse 7. The five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people there and how they dwelt. Then you go down to verse 14. Men answered the five men that went out to spy the country of Laish. Do you know that there is in, well, there is in these houses an ephod and a teraphim? Now this was a day. I'm trying to find a chapter here oh, chapter 18 the first verse again in those days there was no king in Israel now slip over if you can I can on the page to verse 6 of the previous chapter in those days there was no king in Israel every man did that which is right in his own eyes isn't that where we're living now a hedonistic, a hedonistic society. If you like it, do it. Doesn't matter who gets hurt. If, if it satisfies you, go for it. I, I suddenly realized the other day, you know, we talk about man's free will. I'll tell you where it stops. At the grave. From there it's God's will. Our dear Paul was talking, some of you were here, about the kingdom of God. You know, millions of people in thousands of churches have said hundreds of times, Thy kingdom come. And if you ask them going out, what do you mean? They won't have the slightest idea. But dear Dr. Tosa said, If you say, Thy kingdom come, it's my kingdom go. The only way his kingdom can come and take possession of me, and I'm going to talk on this on Friday nights, about the kingdom, is for me to make total surrender, have nothing. A place where self ceases, self interest, self seeking, self glory. And as Dr. Tosi used to say so often, if you saw a man going down Main Street in Jerusalem with a cross, you knew some things about him. Number one, he wasn't coming back. Number two, as soon as he put that cross on his shoulder, he had no plans for the future. And Jesus says, You take up your cross. Taking it up is so difficult, it's getting on it. And yet we're living in a lawless day, we're living in a lawless society, we're living in a, a lawless church. If you tell people you keep the Sabbath, they laugh at you. You keep Sunday sanctified, yes. Why? Because it's the only commandment out of ten with remember on it. Oh, I don't think too much of, uh, about that, I think it's legalism. Well, go down a bit further down in the same ten commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Forget it, it's legalism, go do it. We break one day Sabbath and the word of God says he that breaks one point is guilty of all. It shows that I'm in a state of rebellion. You've taken away my gods and my priest and what have I more? I want to ask you a simple question. It's simple but it's involved. How much could you lose without losing your faith in God? When we lived in England, Dr. 
Edwin Sangster was the head of the Methodist Church. He was a prince of a man, kind of a man I'd like to be built like. He was about six foot one, had black, beautiful wavy hair, marvelous teeth, physically strong, a brilliant scholar in Hebrew and Greek, and I don't know any. I know little Hebrew. He used to repair my slacks in New York. And I know little Greek. I used to park my car in his place, literally. But Sangster was a prince of men. He had a marvelous personality. He filled the pulpit in more ways than one. He was big, strong, but he had a colossal concept of God. Tell you what kind of a man he was. When war broke out, the Second World War, I remember the First World War too. Second World War, they started bombing London. And when the sirens went, you had to go into a deep shelter, underground shelter. Well, most preachers went and lived in the country and came in Sunday morning on the train to preach. Dr. Senster went down in the basement with the prostitutes and drunks and pimps and all the other junk. And he stayed there for three years. Do you know what he did? He wrote a marvelous book. I have a copy of it. One time I think he had all his books. He wrote his thesis for his PhD amidst all the smoking and swearing and dancing and yelling. For three years he stuck at it and got his PhD degree in a hell hole like that. It was typical of the grace of the man. He was the salt. He was the light. He was the authority. There was never any serious, serious fighting in, in the area that he ruled over. Well, he had a friend, a counterpart, in Baltimore, Maryland. And he used to love to tell the story about this man in Baltimore. <coughs> <coughs> he had a very large church. He filled it morning and night. No, no, no preachers can preach twice on Sundays now. It's too much. He preached one Sunday morning on Romans 8:28. And they said the stillness of eternity came down on the meeting. Going out, he stood at the door and people were choking and shedding tears and trying to mumble through their gratitude to, the, their gratitude to him. Oh, that's the most amazing sermon you or anyone else ever preached. God came so near to us, there was the hush of eternity. We want to thank you. Dr. Sanchez says they all went except one little old lady. She looked about 90 and looked as though she'd drunk vinegar every day of her life. And as the others turned, she leapt at him, literally leapt and got all of his lapels and, and hung herself on him. All right for you saying that. You've a rich father. Life has been good to you. You have a home, you have a boat, you have a car. You, you tour in summer, you go away for a month. Well, I don't say it like you say it. Romans 8, 20, all things work together. Not for me. After I'd been married two years, we had a little boy. And he's been chronically sick from then until now. Six months after that, my, wife, my husband died. I guess that was a relief. Life hasn't been good to me. Everything's been wrong. It's been hardship. I can't make ends meet. I've had bad health. I've had little help. And she went through a list of calamities that she had. You, it's all right for you. You were born in a very comfortable home. You've had a marvelous education. You're a wonderful man. You're a great sportsman. You're this one, the other. She rattled it all off to him. He said, the Lord has been good unto me. The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places and I have a goodly heritage. Yes, she barked. And off she went. Next Sunday morning, the church which was usually packed was over packed. They didn't have enough seats. People stood all over the place. That brilliant pastor came and they had to lead him to the pulpit and he felt for the pulpit. And he said... Uh, we had a very blessed Sabbath. I like to call it that name. Sabbath, last Sabbath. One of the most overwhelming meetings we've ever had. 
people are never so gracious and thankful except for one woman. I don't know if you're here this morning. As you know, last Tuesday I was cleaning my sporting gun and it went off and put out both my eyes. I've collected a wonderful library for years. I can't read a thing. I love to get on the lake in my boat. I can't use it. I like to drive through the mountains. I can't do that. I used to stand on certain positions and watch the day dying in the west. I can't do that. Life has suddenly gone from light to darkness, from the fingers that were beckoning me to more spiritual heights, more revelations, more understanding of this profound word, and suddenly I'm pitched into a world of darkness. I don't know if that little lady is here, but lady, please listen. I want to tell you something. I've preached many years in many places, had so-called success, and what have you got? I've talked about God, I've talked about loving kindness, I've talked about tender mercies. But I want to tell you something, lady. With all my years of travel and collecting precious books, and all the accolades I've had, I want to tell you something. Since last Tuesday, Jesus Christ has been more real to me than ever he was when I died to see. He's drawn me to his bosom. He's whispered to me. I can't yet re write, read Braille. It's all coming from my memory. The Lord said, whatsoever he, he, the, the Spirit has taught you, he'll bring to your remembrance. And he's been doing that all the week. And the future is as bright as God. All things work together for God, though everything's adversity and calamity, it seems. You know what? In every trial and affliction of life, when you come out of it, you come out in the, that school or that. Which, what? You come out of it bitter or you come out of it better. You're either drawn nearer to God or you feel somehow God's giving you a raw deal. We, we compare ourselves with ourselves. You've taken away my God. These men came down and they plundered the house. They took his teraphim and his ephod. Ephod is a kind of a rod of divination that some of the priests used. In other words, they, they took everything that was sacred and held to him. You've taken away my God. What have I left? I say, how much could you lose without losing your faith in God? Very simple. Nothing profound about this message for sure. You've got your sight. How many of us thank God for our eyesight today, I wonder? Specifically. I asked that, I think it was in Charles Stanley's church. A lady waited for me afterwards. She said, Mr. Ravenhill, I was in a car accident. And my mind went blank. And my eyes, I couldn't see a thing for over two years. And every morning when I wake up, I have a praise offering to God that I have eyes to see the day. Your sight is precious, but it isn't yours. One of the most charming girls in our church, in the largest church ever had in England. A blonde girl, gracious, sweet. She looked out of the window and two boys were fighting. One picked up a rock to throw at the other and he held a second too long. It came through the window and put her eye out like that. She came more always with one of those buccaneers patches on her eye. She didn't go sour. Her sight is hers. It, you, you own it in one sense, you don't really possess it. Your sight is precious, be sure you thank God for it. Your senses, you may not be the smartest person in the world, but you're not the dumbest anyhow. But supposing for some reason <coughs> you lost your senses. <coughs> I remember in Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Charles Stanley's church again when I mentioned this. A lady came forward and she said, Mr. Ravenel, every morning when I wake up I thank God for sanity. She had been in a car wreck and for five years she couldn't tell anybody's face or tell anybody's place or tell anything at all. And then she said, prayer was made and miraculously my sanity came back. It's just as though I'd never lost it. But she said, Mr. Raymond, you've no idea what it means when there's something in there that kind of can't make sense but it's trying to, it's trying to speak, it's trying to coordinate things and you can't do it. 
your sight's precious, you can't buy it if it can, Mark. Our senses are precious. These are the precious things at which we can lose. I've no power over them. My sight, my senses, my savings. You know, some people's faith go, goes up and down with the Dow Jones averages. Yeah. And other people are tossed this way, that way, and the other. They have not really taken root as the word we sang tonight. You know, there's another thing that you need that God hasn't anticipated. That's a marvelous hymn. What more can he say than to you he'll say? God has no afterthought. If the world lasts another thousand years, God isn't going to say, Oh, I was going to tell, Mo I was going to tell John this on the Isle of Palmas. I forget all about it. We better put a new edition. No, sir, everything that's required for faith, for holy living, for overcoming the world, the flesh and the devil is all found in this book. That's why the devil tries to keep us free from, away from it. Jump over to Job, would you? If you can leap so far. The book of Job in chapter 1. This is a, a thing I'm, I'm sure we don't grasp hold of very often. Job chapter 1 and verse 8. Is God the Almighty, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible? Here is God, what did he do? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? It's not Job talking to God, it's God talking to Satan. Have you seen Job? My servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Perfect, upright, feareth God, and despises evil. Then Satan answered and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? That's a marvelous text. Of course he doesn't. Nobody serves God for naught. It's not payday this week, it's payday at the end of the line. But God keeps perfect accounts. They were saying on, in the news the other day, there are some big, uh, what do you call these modern things, computer had gone wrong and paid two million dollars, I think, into some lady's account. There was only one mistake it made, it wasn't mine. <laughs> Does Job serve God for naught? Isn't it wonderful when God can put a Christian on exhibition and say to the devil, you see that man there? He's as corrupt as anyone else, or he was, but redemption has reached him, and he's sold out to God. He's completely mine. There's nobody like him in all the earth. Verse 9 says, Then Satan answered the Lord. You know, I could get amused sometimes. People say, I say, how are you today? Oh, uh, I haven't had a very good day. Why? Oh, I guess after I'd had my coffee this morning, uh, the devil talked with me about two hours. Well, you're nuts. Why do you listen to him? <laughs> you're not only nuts, you're conceited. How many times did Satan speak? He, he misrepresented God to man. Half God said. The second time he's here when he misrepresents man before God. Does, uh, as we come to it now, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for not? Hast thou not made a hedge about it? That's the devil speaking. You put a hedge around him. No wonder he's perfect, no wonder he's upright. He's the wealthiest man in the world. He's got everything going for him. Why should he rebel? Why should he be negligent in his prayers and devotions? Hast thou not made a hedge around... Oh, I think that's stu super. You don't, by the way, you look anyhow. Just now. I used this before. Looking for a pencil, I don't have. You got a pencil or anything? Money would do, thank you. <laughs> you can get it. Here's Job. <laughs> Not sure he had all those colors, but there you are. <laughs> Maybe that's his sweater. Satan says you set a hedge round about him. Take it away and let me get at him and see what he does. He'll curse you to your face. But he admits that God has put a hedge round about his child. Yes. And he's put a hedge around about you. Yes. And as long as you're obedient, Satan can't get through it. 
would you please take the hedge away? Well, I'm glad God never does what the devil asks anyhow. And Lord says, no, I won't take it away. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put it a bit nearer to him. But before I do, you can have one shot at him. What does it say? Verse 12 says, The Lord said unto him, To Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Take all he has. Strip him. Do it as you like to do it. I give you permission. I'm moving that hedge so that you can go have a whale of a time with him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He can do nothing in the presence of the Lord. As long as you stay in the presence of God, the devil won't get at you if you live to be a thousand. It's when you move out of the presence of the Lord, when you, knew, when you move out of known revelation, when you've made vows and you step out, you don't keep them. But as, as long as God is round about, he can't break through. Again, didn't God say to Abraham, I am thy shield? Not that I'll put a shield before, between me and you. Not that I'll put Gabriel between me. I am your shield. Are you suggesting that the omnipotent holy God has put a shield around me and the devil can stick his finger in me if he wants? Very obviously not. Uh, only upon himself do no evil. Verse 13, there was a day when his sons and his daughters, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the asses feeding beside them. You usually see that, don't you? Oxen ploughing and asses standing still. And the Sabaeans fell and took them away and they've slain your servants with the edge of the sword. Now even I only am left. Oh, that's when the Lord moves a hedge, wasn't it? He moved it away a bit and let Satan have a birthday party, what do you call it, around it. Yes, but you say, I can't get to him because that shield is still there. The Lord, take it away. The Lord says, I won't do that. I bring it a bit nearer to him. The devil comes and what happens? He goes bankrupt overnight. He's the richest man in the world. And they take everything that he has. The Lord pulls the hedge in a bit closer, and while he does, it says there in verse 16, While he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and it's burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am left escaped. The Lord pulls the hedge in a bit closer, and the judgment falls again. Verse 17, While he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, The Chaldeans came out. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't this be some marvelous party? First stroke of the devil was bankruptcy. He took everything he had and left him as poor as when he came out of his mother's room. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking in the house. And there came a great wind and the house fell. And I only am escaped. You see, it was total devastation. The first stroke of the devil against Job is bankruptcy. The second stroke against Job is bereavement. He took all his family, took all his children. Well, where did he go from there? <laughs> no wonder the scripture says, you've heard of the patience of Job. My mother used to tease my dad and say, Walter, you know what it is? Women are more patient than men. Uh, have the, there's a little rhyme about that. You don't know it? I'll have to make it up. No, no. <clears throat> oh, I've got it. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in woman and never found in man. Then Dad used to turn it the other way. Well, I go everywhere to scriptures to get my answers. Uh, maybe it's in the NIV where it says, you've heard of the patience of Mrs. Job. <laughs> Does it say that, Dale? He doesn't know from the NIV. But the authorized version says, you've heard of the patience of Job. 
One stroke and he's gone from being a billionaire to being a pauper. Everything's gone. He hasn't a sheep except what's been burned with fire. He's no property. The houses have gone down. He's lost his camels. He's lost his goats. He's lost everything. While he was yet speaking, there came another in verse 18. And thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. There came a great wind from the wilderness and it fell on the house. Now what do you do? He has a bunch of friends come. You remember them? Eliphaz the Temanite. Bildad is one of the smallest men in the world. He's only a shoe height. Uh, all right. <coughs> That's what it says. He's only a shoe height. That was a tribe or a breed, if you like. And they come and sit in the corner, begin to point the finger. Have you ever noticed how quickly people can get the will of God for you and they couldn't find it themselves in the last five years? <laughs> they find it in five minutes for you. I believe the Lord wants this. Forget them. Well, Job, what kind of a God do you serve? No doubt he prospered you, you're the most wealthy man, the most envied man in the whole world, and all you have is ashes and corpses. Your children are dead, your cattle are dead, everything's dead. I tell you what, isn't it just like the devil to take all a man has and leave him with a nagging wife? Why didn't he let her go? <coughs> You see, there are some things that are mine, they're not mine. My sight isn't mine, I can lose it like that. My senses, I may lose like that. My big fat bankroll, I could lose overnight. But there are some things that are mine. Neither tragedy nor calamity nor adversity can take them. I can shake, shake my fist in the face of the world and the flesh and the devil and say, these things are mine. Job, what are you doing? What are you doing? Look at, look at the ashes, smoldering buildings there. All your thousands of cattle, and your priceless cattle, a camel. And his wife says, curse God and die. Do you know what the Hebrew says? Blaspheme God and commit suicide. That's the only way out. People said they commit suicide because they want to get a way out, but all they do is get a way in. Into worse trouble than they've left behind, into judgment. What did Job do? They were trying to get him angry, you know. Trying to get him to rebel against God. <clears throat> and what did it say then in verse 20? Then Job arose and went his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Oh boy, this must have hurt the devil pretty bad. He must have taken the tailspin after he watched him. He doesn't say, now what's your servant doing now? He says, here, it's obvious what he's doing. And he said, naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord shall take, has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Notice he doesn't say the Lord gave it and the devil took it. He says the Lord gave it and the Lord has taken it away. He won't give the devil any credit. Like Paul never said, I'm the prisoner of sin. Side 2 Satan, from whence comest thou, and Satan answered, from going forth in the earth, hast thou considered my servant Job, there is nobody like him in the whole earth. So this is a bit, a bit of a retread, this. Verse 6, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. You can't touch his life, that's mine. The end of verse 10 says, In all this he sinned not. Now what does he go to do finally? He's getting advice, bad advice from these so-called friends of his. You've got nothing. You're starting off. You're worse now. Man, you, you'd have a flock of wonderful animals, thousands of them. You'd have a marvelous family. They're all dead. Fourteen funerals in one day. What are you going to do? His wife says, well, there's one thing you can do. Curse God and die. Blaspheme his name. He's unfaithful. He's not doing for us what he did for Abraham. Curse God and die. What does he do? He does the very opposite. The first stroke on him was what? Bankruptcy? The second stroke was bereavement. 
It didn't work. So Satan came a bit closer and he's smitten with boils from his head to his feet. Bankruptcy, bereavement, boils. Can't get much worse than that. So he told him to take a, a pot, sir, the piece of a broken pot and scratch where it was hurting him most, I guess. And instead of giving an anthem to the devil or satisfaction to those enemies of his, he stands there if he could stand. I don't know if he could stand with his sickness, his bankruptcy, his bereavement, his boils. And he says, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Just hold it a minute. I'm going to sing a doxology. Supposing it gets worse, what if it does, he says. I don't care what comes out. What I do know is I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he shall stand on the earth one day and I shall be with him there. I won't be looking back to see my property and all those roasted animals. I'm going to be in the presence of my Redeemer. What do you do with a man like that? He's got a joy unspeakable. He's got a faith unshakable. He's got a love unbreakable. If, if he had a fierce loyalty to God, before all this happened, he certainly had a more fierce loyalty afterwards. Go back to Kings a minute here. Oh no, we weren't in Kings, we were in Judges, weren't we? I've forgotten that. Go back to Judges, please. Where is it? Judges is 18, we were in that 24th verse. You've taken away my gods and my priests, and you've gone away, and what have I more? What is this that you've sent to me? What aileth me? Let me go back a minute. What does the Lord say? Go and do as you like with my servant. Send him bankrupt, give him bereavement, give him boils. But you're not going to touch his soul. It's all external that he's losing. He loses nothing internal. In fact, he gains strength all the time, every adversity, and he goes up instead of down. He gets stronger instead of weaker. He gets more assurance instead of more discouragement. Because he has God indwelling him. Come on now. Maybe you're going to be Job this coming week. I kept thinking again and again, I, I'm not sure because I don't know American history too well. I think it was Thomas and Jefferson, Jefferson who said, material abundance without character is the greatest way to a nation's destruction. Material abundance without character. There's no character around. Fidelity is almost gone amongst Christians. Honesty is almost gone. See, all God is doing is putting this man to the extreme test so that he can put him on a, as an exhibition. He not only says to the devil, he says to us, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered the fact he didn't go to church? Have you considered the fact he never had a Bible? Are, are you considering the fact he's surrounded by paganism and heathenism, heathenism and yet you can't quench the fire that's in him? You can't threaten it out of him. You can't wash it out of him. You can't terrify him. We sang about being anchored in God. We're going to be anchored in God or we're going to drift if we're not in the next five years. Is it, is it the end of the 12th or 13th chapter in Hebrews where it talks about everything that can be shaken will be shaken that the kingdom will come? God's going to prove his son and prove the glory of his son to this generation. He doesn't care what happens. I'm not exactly like Brother Dave Wilkerson thinks God's given up on America. I would think God had given up on Israel when you come to Malachi. All the kings, all the mercies, all the revelations, all the prophets. And they go and do the stupid things they'd done before and go into captivity for 400 years. Then God raises up a man by the name of John Baptist and the history is rewritten. Tell me this, don't shout. But just answer the question, do you believe you're precious in the sight of God? Or do you think you're a football for everybody to kick or a dead leaf blown round by the wind? It swirls and swirls and twists the other and blows you over the head and somebody stands on you, a cow puts his pretty foot on you. 
Is my life without a plan? Is my life without purpose? When we lived in Ireland, one of our delights was to... We had a farm and the boys and a couple of men worked for us. But Saturday night we piled into a car and went to a crossroads in the country. All the plough boys came. Came in the rough old boots with mud on and other stuff on and didn't smell too good. But we preached for about an hour and a half there. We sang old hymns. And those Catholic boys listened and couldn't believe it. One night there was an old preacher there. When the meeting was over he came to thank me for the message. I said, well, I'm not sure it was a message. It's a word to these young farmer fellows, they're all Catholic. He said, well, would you come to my house next week and have some tea and scones? Well, if there's anything free, I'm there. So I said, sure. <laughs> and he told me where he lived, and I went. And when I got there, there was this big manor house, a square house, called a manor house usually. I pulled the switch at the door then, I heard the bell ring down the corridor, open the door. Uh, uh, yes. I said, does Dr. So-and-so live here? Yes. She was the oddest woman. I've seen some odd women, but, you know, she looked about like four women that had been separated and then joined up. <laughs> she no shape or anything. Just one big blob. Is your husband in? Yes. But I want to tell you something. Go ahead. He's very queer. Well, I remember what my mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> <coughs> she took me down the corridor. It was made of stone to the house. And here was something like the Smithsonian Museum on, in uh, miniature. Shelves loaded with all kinds of stuff, telescopes, microscopes. And the old man said, Now, I'm glad you've come. We'll have some cookies. We'll have some, did you say cookies? Biscuits and tea. And I looked at his microscope. He said, Have you been to college? I said, Well, yes, about seven or eight months. Have you traveled? Not very far. You've seen a lot of wonderful things, yes. He said, did you ever see through the eye of a fly? I thought his wife's right. <laughs> did I ever see through the eye of a fly? I said, no, I'm, I suppose, because I've never been a fly. <laughs> Come here, he said. And he put this little bit of glass there, and there's a blob on it. Look at it. What can you see? Uh, tapioca pudding. Frog spawn. Bubbles. Wrong. What is that little dot? It's the eye of a fly. All those little things like that that you're talking about are all lenses on that eye. It has 300 lenses on each eye. I said, you mean to say you can see 300 ways this and three... Aren't I an idiot? I'm trying to catch a fly that can see me coming 600 different ways. <laughs> Did you ever see the wing of a butterfly? I've seen lots of butterflies. No, under a microscope, no. So he showed me. You know, a butterfly's wings constructed always this way. And that's what you put for strength, isn't it? A triangle, you put that in the roof. On the wing of a butterfly, there are 3,000 little triangles. Well, what's that got to do with Job? It's got a lot to do with me. Are you suggesting that the eye of a fly, a little thing like that, that one minute's there and the bird swallows it? Are you suggesting that the Creator designed the eye with three hundred lenses on each eye? And yet me that he redeemed, he has no plan and purpose? That little frail butterfly. I remember seeing one in the Atlantic one. Somebody, over, somebody on the ship said, look at that butterfly there. I don't know how in the world he got there. The beautiful thing was going over the waves. The wave could have wiped it out like that. But God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for your life. We sang that hymn that moves me so much tonight. All he's doing, I don't care how hot the furnace is. Do you think by choice the three Hebrew children would have gone in the fire? 
They went in. What, what, what happened? The best thing that could happen to them. What happened to them? Well, they were bound hand and foot and the fire burned off what the world had put onto them. They didn't have a pen knife. There's no way to get out of it so God says get in the fire. Furnace, put the furnace up, put it up. And the heathen king says, you put three men, the form of the fall, like unto the Son of God. And that situation that you're in, God put you in it so the form of the fall might be seen. He's not looking at David Daphne. He says, I want to do something in David Daphne. I'm putting him in a certain situation and I couldn't do it in him any other way. You don't become saints by going to Bible school, I'm sorry. We don't become saints by reading our Bibles. We become saints as we walk in the will of God and somewhere there's trial and persecution and difficulty for everybody. It was on the Isle of Patmos, which was the devil's island of the day. It was the Alcatraz of that time. Yeah. They dumped all the criminals and all the filthy people there. And God puts John there and the windows of heaven open. We want God to open the windows by sitting with our backs to a tree in a field there and smelling nice smells and all the rest of it. But that's not the way God matures us. Hmm. I have some things of the mind they're not mine my sight isn't mine my sense is not mine my securities are not they can all disappear but I have some things of the mind I shake my fist in the face of the world the flesh and the devil and I say my faith I love that American hymn my faith looks up it's my faith you can't take my faith the devil can't take my faith if I lose my faith I lose it Jesus said, my peace, not peace, my peace. The peace he had when they wanted to push him over the brow of the hill and destroy him. The peace when he walked into the temple with 6,000 people there. The peace when he went to Golgotha. The peace that he had when he was there on the cross. I'm going to leave you. And in the 14th of John, remember, he says, the comfort of the Holy Ghost. We misuse that word. Mr. Chadwick used to say to us often, gentlemen, remember, it says comforter there, but the Holy Spirit is not a comforting mother. A nursing mother for spiritually sick children. If you go into Isaiah, it says that, uh, they were making something and they comforted it with nails. They fixed it with nails. And sometimes he puts the nails there. There's a hymn that we've, uh, many of us have come to love. Another great American hymn written by Annie Johnson Flint. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He giveth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trial is multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of, en our store of endurance, when our strength, was, our strength has failed, ere the day is half done, when we, we reach the end of our hoarded resources, but the Father's full giving is only begun. And the chorus of that is, His love has no limits, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundary known unto men. But out of the fullness of blessing in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. You see, God hasn't revealed Himself much to me yet, you say. Well, go to prison. Become a, a, not just a literal prison, become captive to circumstances or captive to an infirm. The young lady that wrote that, you know, at six years of age, lost her mother and father, was taken care of by some people who looked after for 22 years. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow. She's broken hearted over her parents. Some other tragedy came in her life. At 14 years of age, she was so crippled with arthritis, she couldn't even walk. From there to the end of her life, it became a battle song. And people went to see her because of her serenity. I said 14, not 40. At 14 years of age, she could write and say, He giveth more grace. My burdens get greater, but there are corresponding greatness. If you've read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, remember the, pilgr the evangelist says to the pilgrim, See us thou yonder shining light. Keep your eye on it. When he's got a certain way, there's a, a big monstrous lion. And he thinks he'll put him out and knock me flat. And as he gets to him, he sees there's a chain and he's fastened to a tree. 
say, the, the type of the devil could only come so far and God stops him. He goes further up the road and he sees a flaming fire and he wonders how he'll get past. And he sees men throwing water on that fire. But the more water they throw on, the fiercer the fire goes. So he went round the back to see what was happening. At the front there were, <coughs> there were men with little buckets of water throwing it on the fire. At the back there were angels with bigger buckets throwing on oil. But you get to the fire before God starts doing that. <coughs> he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He giveth more strength when the labors in increase. <coughs> I remember in England there's a, a tiny thought. We had teachers that loved poetry and we had to learn about Longfellow and Shortfellow and I don't know when the word we can read about. Oh, I'm going to give you an American poem. You can memorize this by next time you come to school. Classic American poem, Little Orphan Annie's come to our house to stay, to wash the cups and saucers up and brush the comes away and chew the chickens off the porch. Do you know that, Brother Dave? And you, you passed a law degree and don't know that? Oh, I'll have to take you back to the teacher. Hmm. Amazingly enough, that's his best known poem. But he wrote another about the robber. I think it's the essence of wisdom. The night was dark and the night was late when the robbers came to rob him. They picked the lock of the palace gate when the robbers came to rob him. But they robbed him not of a single... They, they stole his jewels and gems of state, his coffers of gold and his priceless plate when the robbers came to rob him. But loud, loud, loud laughed he in the morning red when the robbers had been to rob him. For they robbed him not of a single shred of the childish dreams in his wise old head. And yet, welcome to all else, he said. In other words, it's garbage. You can't steal my memories. You can argue about the DAT. You can argue about scripture. My old cliche, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And I don't believe truth is truth until you get, get it into your life. You have no authority to speak. You know, every one of us is a living evidence of our theology. Yeah. I wouldn't ask you to sit down and write it out. I'd like to live with you a week and I'll see what your theology is. I'd see if you go up and down with circumstances. They stole his jewels, his gems of state, his coffers of gold, his priceless plate. But loud laughed he in the morning red. They've robbed me not of a single shred of, the, of childish dreams in my wise old head. And they're welcome to all things else, he said, when the robbers came to rob him. But that's not bad, is it? Come on, when you sang it tonight, did you mean it? When darkness veils his lovely face. Nice to sing it here, isn't it? We're all of one accord. Enjoying the presence of the Lord. When darkness veils his lovely face and you're all by yourself next week. And there's nobody believes in you, nobody trusts you. I found out something when I was about 40. I wish I'd found it when I was 20. If you met, took a vote on who is the finest Christian in America, and I was up there. Number one Christian not only in America, in the whole world. Leonard Ravenhill's number one. The Lord wouldn't say, well, I had him somewhere down here, I better shift that, because public opinion says he's the greatest saint walking. And then next year there's a vote. And no one likes me, they got sour at something I said. They spread rumors about me, they tried to degrade me. You know what, I'm always glad that God never listens to the gossip except to, except to judge it. If you say I'm the greatest saint in the world, you won't put me up there. And if you say I'm the worst, you won't put me down there. There's only one person can change God's mind about you, and that's you. Right. If you want to live stupidly, if you want to do wrong things, well, well, it'll come back to you. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. Oh. 
I was reading this week. Maybe the best known of Wesley's hymns is Love Charles Wesley's. John wrote some. But Charles wrote 6,300 hymns. And in one of them he says this, Though waves and storms go o'er my head, Though health and wealth and friends be gone, Though joys be withered all and dead, And every comfort be withdrawn, On this my steadfast soul relies, Father, thy mercy never dies. It seems to me that Paul, in the many amplified ways of living, and his missionary testimony and so forth, he just about exhausted the devil. Because at the end of Romans 8, you remember he says, What shall separate us? Or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or famine, or peril, or nakedness, or sword, all things present? And then with a holy defiance, puts his shoulder back and spits in the face of the devil and says, No things to come. You can get the furnaces in hell going to make an instrument of torture for me. I want to tell you something. There's nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. You can separate me from a fellowship. You can take my Bible from me. You can't take my memory. Waves and storms go o'er my head, and wealth and health and friends are gone. Though joys be with it all and dead, and every comfort be withdrawn. The most read book outside of the Bible was Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I once sat in the chair where he wrote that. didn't make me a writer. And I looked in that little place where he wrote. Fifteen years in prison he produced Pilgrim's Progress. And if you haven't read it, the second volume is better than that. Called The Holy War. Which he reveals the, 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 uh, the soul of man. The battle that goes on in the soul of man. But Paul says, neither tribulation, nor distress, nor famine, nor peril, nor nakedness, and say, not things present. And he just about exhausted all the temptation and trial and persecution a human being could take. And he says, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, and I love that last thing, nor any other creature. Go back to hell where you came from, Satan, you're wasting your time with me. He says, I'm steadfast, and I don't believe he preached a thing that was a theory. When he says be steadfast and unmovable, he's because he's rooted and grounded in God. He moves out of Romans 7, I, 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 I. To Romans 8. In Romans 7 you have, I think that I there is mentioned, what, 32 times. But not once does the Holy Spirit get mentioned in Romans 7. You cross the bridge into Romans 8 and 19 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned and I is only mentioned twice, verses 18 and 38. I am persuaded. I reckon that the present life, things that come, the so poor in the, in the light of eternity. You hear people say, in fact, I read an article recently, a man sent me, he wrote written an article there on Revelation, gave the scriptures, at least he gave chapter and verse. For those people who lose their faith, you don't lose your faith. You don't lose your first love. I'm giving you something no man taketh it from you, he said, and he's, he's within a week of the cross, and yet he's full of joy. And he says, this same joy that will carry me through will carry you through. You say you want to follow the Lamb with us wherever he goes, well, follow him to the cross. I often wonder why the disciples didn't stand on either side of the road as he went even to Gethsemane or from Gethsemane and the judgment hall down to the filthiest place in the world. Hebrews 13, 13 says, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people, suffered without or outside the gate. That was where the sewage went. That was the only place where lepers were allowed to walk free. It stunk of death, it stunk of leper. I went to a leper colony once, and good night. I guess about 300 feet before we got there, the, the stench was horrible. Then when I saw the people, some of them just had a string holding in their eye. You could see their tongue joined down here. Some of them just had half an arm, all yellow with gangrene and pus running off it. So they had no fingers, and they were taking their stunts and saying, Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, we have so many possessions, God is merciful. 
If you look back, when you do life's actually get along with God and say, I thank you for I sight even to read your word. Thank you for I sight to see the beautiful flowers. The house we've been going to, this just a gorgeous carpet of flowers outside. Our fences. Boy, we've been in serious trouble if we lost them. And yet it's easily possible. Everything round about us, as Francis Henry Light said, change and decay in all around I see, all thou who changeth not, abide with me. Yes, he'll give you more grace than you've ever known in your life, when the burdens grow greater. He'll give you more strength when the labors increase. To add his affliction, he'll add your mercy, his mercy. You see, we, we want them down for a, a kind of a, a penny installment, and we want to become millionaires. The path of persecution isn't easy, when I'm sure of that. What would I do without my Bible? No, I'm of, I'm of more value, as good scripture says, than many sparrows. If God designs the eye of a fly, which is so miraculous, if he reinforces the wing of a butterfly, which is so gentleman, do you think that my spiritual life can have a miscarriage? The only way it can happen is by disobedience. Again, in, John, in Luke, pardon me, in John 16, he says, My joy I give you, and no man taketh it from you. It's my faith, it's my peace, it's my joy. I like that hymn, we've sung it sometimes. Thank you. My faith looks up to thee. It was written in the Old North Church there in Boston. I preached in that church and asked them to sing the hymn that night. It was written by one of the men in the church and Lowell Mason wrote the tune. And it's blessed the world. My faith looks up to thee, thou arm of Calvary. My faith. You can't do anything for my faith. You can't destroy it, you can't discourage it. It's my faith. And if my faith is rooted in grounded in God, you'll waste your time, the devil will waste his time, circumstances will waste their time. I try to live every day with gratitude that I live in America. You've lived in here all your life. I stood in bread lines at four o'clock in the morning in World War I. We went well through World War II and saw the neighborhood blown up and God spared us. <clears throat> all the blessings we have, we can't count them. And yet how thankful are we? I've been reading this week about that precious man, Wycliffe, that translated the Bible. <laughs> I should have brought the introduction of his life to you. He went to college in 15, I don't know, about 61 went to the university he went in for prayers at six o'clock with the rest he'd been up for prayers at five o'clock alone he buried his feet in the rushes on the floor because it was so cold when it came to the mid-morning break he spent a penny on beef and shared it with four, three other students a penny worth of beef for four of them to share then they went back and listened to a lecturer till five in the evening and the meal wasn't much better. Then they studied an hour or two in a cold, cold room. And the last thing they did before going to bed, they ran around the grounds of the university to get warm to go to bed. And from there, the rest of his earthly pilgrimage, he was dogged, he had the prices put on his head. He had to flee here, he had to take refuge there, he had every crazy discomfort you could think of. And in all the time, he's carrying the precious word of God and interpreting it. He made a vow, I'll put the Bible, which is in the hands of scholars, I'll put it in the hands of every ploughboy in England, and he did it. He paved the way for this precious word that you have. Yes. This book, which again is not a book, it's a, it's a library. How much can I lose without losing And I lose it, nobody can lose it for me. If I lose my peace, I forfeit it. If I lose my faith, I forfeit it. If I lose my joy, I forfeit it. They are mine. 
The other things are not mine. My sight isn't mine. My freedom isn't mine. We might be locked up a few years from now in some stinking hole of a prison. We might not get a clean shirt for a year if we ever get one. All these things which we take for granted so easily could all be taken. But when you strip me of everything external, everything that I owe, not to my skin, is subject to being to theft or destruction. But from my skin inward, it's mine. It's my peace, it's my joy, it's my love, it's my faith. It's my will to do the will of God. Well, I'll stop there anyhow. Maybe you'll go home and write a list of things you could lose without losing your faith in God. I'm saying, I try to think of Russia every day. I don't like to go a day without praying for Russia. I think of some men who have been incarcerated for 20 years. And their skin is as yellow as, as butter. And when they've been offered freedom, they won't take it. I think it was Faber that wrote a marvelous verse, ill, ill, when you're ill. Ill that he blesses is our good, and unblessed good is ill, and all is right that seems most wrong, when it be his sweet will. We don't have enough spiritual intelligence to know what's good for us. We want God to bulldoze every mountain out of the way. He says, I won't do it, I'll give you strength to get over it. You've heard me pray more than once, many times, maybe many more times. I don't understand that the judgment seat of Christ with billions of eyes on me and hear Jesus Christ say, Son, while you were down there in Texas, I had many things to tell you, but you couldn't bear them. Adversity will come, calamity may come, tragedy may come. But either in the word of God or out of it, we have enough evidence to see that people have stood the fiery blast, they stood torture, they've been denied freedom, they've been denied every creature, come, and yet they have been the lights that shine most in the sky tonight. You know, our blessings have become a curse. I thought of this man trying to buy a pen, penny pencil. He's going to translate the word of God as nobody ever else translates it. A friend of mine, his son's going to college. His, his wife said, well, he couldn't go in that beaten up car, you know. I mean, with a name like ours, let's buy him a brand new... So they bought him a brand new car. And of course, he's have to have some recreation. Let's get him a whole set of golf clubs. So I've got a new set of golf clubs. And he must have a typewriter. I look at all those books in my library sometimes and think to myself, not one of those men ever type, had a typewriter. He didn't have a ballpoint pen, bless you. He had a goose feather in it. I my dad had one. I remember the silly thing used to split. You had to split the goose feather at the end. And then you had to clip it so it would write properly. <laughs> Mine never did much good. And then you put it in the ink and pulled it out and blobbed it on the, there and start all over again. Good Lord, we get more and more lazy. Ballpoint, forget it. I want the, what do you call them, print out thing? What do you call them, Patty? A computer. Is that, is it called? A word processor. <laughs> Soon you see your son going to, your, your son's going to college, you'll see a U-Haul behind him to bring all his gear. <laughs> three, three cameras, a, road, uh, a word processor, Golf clubs and enough food and chewing gum for, for the next five years. <laughs> and they'll, they'll sit for five, four subjects and get F minus on all of them. Well, finally, all you have to do is look at the life of Jesus. From the moment he was born until he died, he was under suspicion. I could have thought of Mary going down the street and saying, she's the one that bore that bastard. So they sure said it. I would think of John the Baptist's parents when they say, you know, he left home when he was 15. He's never been seen since. They say he's gone to Arabia. He's making money there. And he'd gone down there into a horrible place. 
but God was with him. Here's the last one. Here's Joseph up here. And his father sends him down to Dothan to take cheese and bread for his brothers. So he goes down to Dothan. When he gets to Dothan, they put him down in a pit. When he gets down in the pit, they pull him out and he goes down into Egypt. When he gets down into Egypt, he goes down in another pit. I think it's in that amazing speech, isn't it, in the seventh of Acts, where young Stephen gives a brief history, a fantastic history of Israel, and he talks about Joseph, and he said they hurt his feet. In other words, they put his feet in fetters. He's gone down from, Do from his home to Dothan, Dothan down in a pit, out of the pit down to Egypt, uh, Egypt in another pit. And then he's a blessing to a, a butler or a baker or somebody. And he prays and they get deliverance and they walk out and he's left. His brother sold him, you remember. Then he came to the place where he faced up to his brothers or they faced up to him. He could have put them all in jail for the rest of their lives. He could have ordered their deaths. Instead he said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. That thing in your life just now, the devil wants for evil, God said it's going to turn out good. Because what you're going through is something some man invented or some man created. And behind it stands the omnipotence of God. But you've got to pass this lesson. You can't skip it. So he's got to the bottom. Let's bring him out. He's gone down from his home to Dothan, down from Dothan to a pit, down from a pit into Egypt, and Egypt down into another pit. And then he finds favor with the king, and the king goes out of town and leaves him sitting on the throne and puts a chain round his neck. He's Lord of the universe at that time. But look what God did, stripped him of everything. Loneliness, down in a stinking, messy old pit. And hurt. And there's never a, a, an indication in the word of God anywhere that he ever murmured. I think he's one of two perfect characters in the Old Testament. He and Daniel. You can't find any fault in their lives. But all the trusting and the trial. So what's it all about? Let me finish with this. What you sang tonight. Do you think God is capricious? Do you think he wakes up in moods? I thank God he doesn't have mood. Some people, you, you see them in the morning, they have a smile from ear to ear or ear to yonder anyhow. It's the big, big toothpaste smile, as Dr. Tulsa used to say. Another day they grew me and... Mm, yeah, 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 it is. It is a good day, yeah. A lovely day. <laughs> Hope I don't ever meet you, in the snow, meet you in a snowstorm. He's not capricious. All he's doing in your life and mine is by seeking by dross to consume. I'll say this in a flash. When I was lying in hospital with a broken back, broken feet, 4,000 miles away from home, wondering what the boys were doing, jumped out of a burning hotel at 3 o'clock in the morning in pajamas. That's not right for preachers to be walking around in pajamas. I wasn't right. I was lying all broken in snow. I couldn't get up. And all kinds of men came. Some of the most famous preachers in America came to see me. They're very gracious. One day, Dr. Tozer brought a man. He said, Brother Leonard, this man got on the last boat of people that were fleeing from China. The man was yellow and he was all pockmarked. And he said, Brother, this is Leonard Ravenhill, he said. He's like a lion when he preaches. And well, I kind of smiled. And the little man walked up the man like that and just put his hand over me and said, Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. And the hymn says, That soul, though all hell should endeavor to... You, let, you think sometimes you have a hell on your own. You think the devil is not touching a single person in the world except you. And sorrows like sea billows roll. Calamities come like the waves of the ocean. You're going to be engulfed and then God steps in. He's trying to say, test my faith. You know, I believe as we die, we'll be like that all through eternity. I don't believe you'll add to your faith in heaven that much. This life is the probation. I can't help but marvel at the blessed Apostle Paul when he says, I glory in tribulation. I don't just say, give, give me grace, Lord, to get through today. I nearly fell out yesterday. 
He says, I glory in tribulation, in necessities, in reproaches. Everything that everybody else is running away from, he embraces it. He hugs it, kisses it. Thank you, Lord, for trusting me. One of America's most famous preachers came to see me when I was in hospital. I'd preached the revival in his church. And he just looked, shook his head. He said, Brother Ravenel, God would never trust me with this. I couldn't take it. It one of the greatest experiences that ever came to my life. I was going to, on a world mission, I was going to change the world instead of I lay on my back for two years. And I had horrendous pain and all the rest. Lots of other people have had it. But God did so many things in my life then, I never learned at college or anywhere else since. It's facetious almost to say, the school of experience is the best school in the world. When God's at the control, when he's the tutor, when he's working out the program. He doesn't say, would you like some algebra watered down? He says, get to it. Do you want to testify, great is thy faithfulness? How can you do it when you've never proved him? But when you've come through the furnace and the fire, as Tozer used to say, you need the furnace, the fire, the furnace, uh, and the file to get us to a place of completeness. Well, praise the Lord. You feel better now or worse? Well, we're going to pray now. And again, if you wish to leave, you feel free to leave. It's what, 25 of 10. So we're going to have a We won't sing. We'll just go straight to prayer. And if you wish to leave, feel free to, for, to go. We'll pray, I suppose, maybe.